I came home from college to visit my family for the summer, as a you know college student would. And within, uh, I think, two days, the second day I was there, uh, I received a call. It was from my mom. Um, after hearing my mother explain to me in general what was going on, uh, and again I say in general, it was very vague, and so I had no clue what I was going to see. I remember feeling like having to actually think to move my feet forward, not wanting to go and just kind of leave that lasting memory and that legacy of my dad, that picture that he's, you know, he's my Superman and just tell him, I know you're going to get up. And I saw him in a bed. He had tubes, you know, in his nose and he had three of the four major arteries uh, clogged. And what we didn't know is that that's something somewhat of a hereditary issue, but we just assumed because of his just great athleticism, there's no way that would happen to him. There was definitely feelings of what am I now living for and becoming discouraged. The thought had never crossed my mind to take my own life, but I was at such a low point, I felt like I could relate to those who had done it. The greatest part of all this story is that my dad is not gone, he's not dead, uh, he's physically alive, he's, he's mentally very much detached, his brain has lost a tremendous amount of functionality and therefore his body can't respond. But what he does have, we, we cherish and I look at now as, uh, what a feisty guy, you know, what a, what a competitor, literally, for life. It was tough to see at that time, but as I look back, almost a decade later, I know that God was with me through uh, easily the toughest time that I personally had in, in, in my life. Life changes, struggles hit. A man who played professional basketball and football at a point where life changes radically. Finances change. You're on top, things come apart. Your own health, relational worlds have these shifts and all of a sudden what you thought was stable is coming apart at the seams. And just walking through just a normal day of life sometimes feels like, how do you make it through? For the next four weeks, we're going to kind of set up camp, put our tent stakes into the ground, and just stay in a place of talking about what does it look like to make it strongly through tough times, to be empowered by the presence of God. Because when we hit tough times, when there's loss and pain and sorrow or struggle, when we're just trying to walk through life and make it, what we realize is there's different postures, there's different ways to kind of come at this journey of life. And, and our world really offers us two dramatically different options. Our world really offers two ways to respond to making it through daily life and the challenges of life. One response is this. I am powerful. I can do it all by myself. You hear little kids say that after a while. They get to a point and say, Daddy, Mommy, I'm going to do it all by myself. And we're so proud of them because I mean, that's the goal in life, to do it all by yourself. Well, is it? And so in our world, we, we, we walk this journey of life, and there's this sense that some people go, here's my position. I will handle it. I will take care of it. I can do it on my own, in my own strength, in my own power, in my own ability. I will be powerful. And even if sometimes I don't feel powerful, I'm certainly going to act like I am, because that's the way you get through life. And I want to say to you, as we walk into this four-week series, this place of saying, I am powerful, is not a biblical position. It's not a godly place to be, and I don't think it's even a wise place, even if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, to say, I'm going to make it through life in my own power, my own strength. But that's one of the options that the world seems to give us, is to say, I'm powerful, I can do it by myself. The other option that's becoming very popular in our world, and you will recognize this, is this option. I am powerless. <laughs> I can do nothing. I'm a victim. My situation is hopeless. I can't make it through. I've looked at the situation. I've assessed my own ability. And I don't think I'm powerful. I think I'm powerless. And more and more in our world and our culture, we're getting this place of victimization where people just say, I can't do anything. 
The world can take care of me, or I'll just kind of curl it up in a ball over here and lay there, because I can't do anything. And you say, you say well, those, those two are not very pleasant options. You know, I, I'm powerful. I have to kind of, in my own power, my own strength, do everything in our heart of hearts. We know we aren't powerful enough to do everything. Or, or, but I don't want to be this powerless victim. But I think that those are the two primary options the world gives us. The Bible gives us another option. The Word of God gives us another option. The presence of the Spirit of God living in a person who's put their faith in Jesus gives us another option. And that is to be empowered. Not powerful in ourselves, not weak and powerless because of our limitations, but empowered every moment of every day by the presence and the strength and the spirit of the living God who lives in us if we've come to him by faith in Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you can walk this empowered life. And if you don't know Jesus, there's an endless supply of power available to you through faith in Jesus Christ. When someone comes to faith in Jesus, it says that the God of the universe, by his spirit, moves inside of you and lives in you. You want to talk about being empowered. You want want to talk about alternative energy sources. God is the ultimate alternative energy source because he never runs out. He spoke and the universe came to be. What does the empowered life look like? Let me give you some perspective. All right, Sam, would you come here and join me? Sam is a trained weightlifter, and uh, oh, it's wow, well, yeah, man, this is a, you're gonna this is impressive. You can put this over. So, anyways, apparently Sam can lift this and put it over his head three times. One, two, three. And so, Sam, thank you. First of all, thank you for helping. Just so wait, just just take it, lift it to your waist. Wait, 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 wait. Then up to here, over your head, and then one, two, three. And then gently put it back down again. You ready? Okay. Let's go. Okay. You can't do it. Okay. Let's, 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 you, I that was pretty good, though. That was all the way up to here. All right. All right. So, Sam is not powerful in and of himself. Sam is not powerless, but Sam has an option. So I've got two other highly trained professional weightlifters to come and join me here. Come on, guys. And musicians. And those always go together. Come on. (laughs) So um, thank you, guys. So now what I'm going to do is, Sam, I'm going to ask you again to take this, to lift it to here, up to here, one, two, three, and down again. They're not going to lift it for you. They're going to partner with you. They're going to help you. So I want you to give everything. You you do all that you can, and they'll help you where they need to, okay? Here we go. Three times. Let's go. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Three times, Sam. Three times. Push it, push it, push it. One. All right. One more. Push it. One more. Go. All right. Put it down. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You guys can take that with you. Thanks, Sam. You go see. Here's the picture. Here's the picture. An empowered life is a life where you understand, listen closely, that God calls you to do everything you can do to do your part, but that God comes along by his Holy Spirit, and he does the part that you can't do. He lifts the part you can't. The the thing about God is God doesn't just come in and go, just lay there, eat bonbons, I'll do it all for you. That's not the heart of God. He calls us to do our part, to lift the part of the weight that we can, but the empowering presence of God gives us the strength to do what we could not do in and of ourselves. We do what we can. God does what we can't. And together, every moment and every part of life, we can live an empowered life with an endless reservoir of God's power and strength pulsing through us, coursing through our lives, flowing through our hearts. That's a life worth living. And some of you are over in this powerful place. I can do it. I can handle it. Whether it's business, whether it's life, whether it's finances, whether it's relationships, I don't need anybody's help. I can do it all by myself. And you know in your heart of hearts you know you can't, but you keep faking it, <laughs> trying to hang, because that's what you think you're supposed to do. Some of you have wandered into this world of powerlessness, of victimization. I just can't do anything. But God wants us to be in this place where we understand that he's made us, he's formed us, there's things he's birthed into us, gifts and abilities, and we should use those to the fullest. 
But we don't have enough to do everything we need to do in a given day, in every relationship, in our lives. But God says, but I do, (laughs) and I will empower you. I will fill you. I will guide you. And here's the beauty of it all. God's power reserve never runs out. So if you've come to God through faith in Jesus and his Holy Spirit lives in you, you have an endless supply of all the strength that he wants you to have. Not always whatever you want, but always what he wants you to have. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we begin this series being honest. Some people sitting here today have to just say, God, I've been walking the powerful route. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it all. And man, I'm at the end of myself. I'm exhausted. Or maybe I'm still trying to do it all, and I think I can. But Lord, when we come to that place where we realize we can't do it all, that we're not powerful in our own strength, speak to us. Lord, some here today have just decided they can't do anything, and they're just comfortable letting everybody else take care of them. And they're not doing their part. They're not lifting their weight. And I pray you'd speak to them as well. And I pray that every single person here who's put their faith in you, Jesus, would over these four weeks discover this, just this amazing flow of your power, your strength, your glory, your presence flowing into and through their lives. And I pray for anyone who's here during this series who's never yet discovered this amazing source of power and strength, that they will come to the cross in these four weeks. They will meet you, Jesus. And they will find that through you living in them, they can have all the strength they need to be empowered moment by moment and day by day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to introduce you to three people today. Now, when I say I introduce you, I can't fully tell you all about these three people. They're three people from the Bible. And I'm going to give you introductions, meaning I could preach entire sermons, sermon series on each of these characters. But I want to just have you meet them so that you might be inspired to go open the book, open the Bible, and learn more about them. But I want you to meet three people who went through very difficult times, and they discovered they didn't have to be powerful and that they weren't powerless. But by the presence of the living God, they were empowered. They're just three beautiful examples of people who really knew God's strength. And particularly, each of these four weeks together, we're going to talk about one way that God empowers us by his presence, by his spirit. So four weeks, and each week a different way. And today we're talking about probably the most challenging of the four. I thought we'd start with the toughest. How's that sound? We're going to talk about how God empowers us through suffering, through loss, through pain, through heartache. And some of you say, I don't really want to talk about how God empowers us through suffering and pain and loss and heartache. But here's the truth of the matter. And almost every person here who's walked with Jesus for any length of time, you know it's true. When have you felt God the closest? When have you felt his power fill you where you said, I can't take another step? And all of a sudden, he filled you and carried you on. It's in the tough times. One of the times that God meets us, one of the ways that God empowers us is in those moments where we realize, in my weakness, I don't have the strength to do it. And then we say, but I'll do what I can. And God fills us with the rest of the strength, strength that amazes us. And we press on. And I want you to meet three people who discovered the powerful presence of God in the midst of struggle and pain. The first one is one whose name has sort of become synonymous with suffering in the Bible and even in culture. People who don't even know the Bible very well will talk about the suffering of Job. And and so, first I want to think about a lesson from Job. Holding on to God when the world comes crashing in. Holding on to God. Holding on to his power when the world just seems to be coming apart. I mean coming apart in a big way. Some of you are there today. In Job's story, and it's found in the Bible in the book of his name, Job. And the whole book is about his story from friends that came along and tried to give him counsel and God coming along and speaking. The whole thing is this amazing, beautiful, poetic story of a man going through incredible loss and suffering. I want to introduce you to him. I can't tell you his whole story. It would take too long. But Job was a man who loved God, was righteous before God, and people could see it. He followed after God, had a wonderful family, had a great family business, as a matter of fact, one of the most wealthy people in the world at his time. And it just seemed like, you know, loved God, great family, great business, life was going great. And then, just like, just like waves slamming on the coast, boom, this after, one after another, this, you know, his family is crushed. His heart is broken. His material goods are stolen or destroyed. His body 
is ravaged with sickness. It's hard to even comprehend. That's why people say the suffering of Job. It's like this hard to imagine thing because it was so profound. It was just like moment after moment, day after day, in a short range of time, his whole life just seemed to be assaulted. And when you read the story, you'll see that there's more going on behind the scenes spiritually and more happening, and, and there's even conflict with his wife during this time. She lives, but there's conflict with her. It's just, it's just every part of his life is just coming apart. So he's literally sitting on a pile of ashes with his body with sores all over his body, his family decimated, his heart broken, his wealth gone, his health stripped away, and he's sitting there, and he cries out to God. What do you say to God when it seems like everything in your world has come apart? This is what Job says in Job 1, verses 20 to 21. At this, Job got up, and he tore his robe, and he shaved his head. This is a sign of deep mourning. He was honest about his pain. He was honest. He didn't act like it was fine. He didn't try to, oh, I'm powerful. This is easy. He, he, he mourned openly and publicly. He was in pain and torment in his soul. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell to the ground. Listen to this. In worship. In worship. Probably not a happy praise song, but in submission to God. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. How do you do that? Only when you know a God who is with you. Ultimately, we're empowered by the very presence of the living God. When we're plugged into God, and God is plugged into us through faith, we can hold on. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and one day when this life ends, naked I will leave this world. I came in with nothing, I'll go out with nothing. The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord Almighty be praised. You got to get to know this guy Job better. You got to read his book. You got to read his story in the Bible. Here's my challenge to you when it comes to living an empowered life hold on, hold on, and know that God is holding on to you. This is what Job did. He just, he just held on to God. He talked honestly to God. He mourned. He lamented. He didn't act like it was fine and easy, but he held on to God. You, you know. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know that it's those moments where there's pain and sorrow and struggle and heartache. It's those moments where you hit this crossroads and you decide, am I going to go, God, I've had enough of this. You didn't protect me. You didn't take care of me. You didn't do things the way I thought you should. I don't understand. I'm walking away or at least getting, my, getting some distance from you. Most of us have been there at some moment or another where the pain is deep and we just say, I just, I don't understand. And we kind of pull away. Or in those moments, you turn to God. And you hold on. And you say, God, there's nowhere else I can go. You alone have strength. You alone have hope. And at the end of Job's story, there's restoration and there's hope and there's healing. But it was hard. And it was painful. And there was deep, real loss on about every level you can imagine. And those who want to live an empowered life in those times, they just Hold on to the only one who has power to carry him through. They don't say, I'm powerful. I can do it all by myself. I don't need God. They don't say, I'm so powerless, there's no hope. They hold on to the source of hope, the God who loves them, the God who made them. And even when they don't understand, and even when they're in pain, they hold on and hold on. In those moments, they had this, this realization, not only are they holding on to God, but that God has his arms around them. He's holding on even when they don't see it and feel it, they know it's true. They hold on to God. I want you to listen to some words that, that I think if Job were here right now, if Job could come and kind of say his heart after walking through, what would he say to us? How would he challenge us? How would he encourage us to be empowered and to hold on to God through tough times? So just listen to these words. I'm going to have some of the congregation read. Dear friend, Hold on to God. Even when the storms come, the roof crashes down, 
and your loss feels so deep and painful that you are certain you can't make it through another day. God is still on the throne. He really is. He made the heavens and the earth. He is powerful and sovereign. He loves you and has a good plan for your life. Your story is still being written, and God is the author. God gives and he takes away, but his name is always worthy of praise and blessing. Though your body is ravaged, your heart is broken, your finances evaporated, and your friends seem useless in your pain, God is still God. Hold on to him in faith. Be relentless in trust. Open your eyes and see the one who rules, reigns, and loves you. Even when you look to him through a river of tears, he is still God. He is near. He has not forgotten you. Some of you need to get to know Job better. You need to meet this man of faith who walked through the pain, came out the other side. I want you to meet someone else. His name is Paul. Paul was a religious Jewish leader who hated Christians. First century, knew about Jesus, and was doing all he could to destroy the church and destroy Christians. And Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus in a vision. He met Jesus Christ, and he became a follower of Jesus. And when he started to follow Jesus, God called him to preach. God called this man whose name was Saul. He changed his name to Paul, and he said, now spend your life telling other people about me. Preach about me. So he did. He was faithful to preach in the name of Jesus. Well, you'd figure now, since he's being faithful and following God, life's going to go smooth. Because, you know, when you become a Christian, when you follow Jesus, everything goes your way, and all your debt goes away, and your back pain's gone, and life's perfect, right? And so he becomes a Christian, he follows Jesus, and he goes out to preach. And his whole life became this journey of navigating pain as he preached Jesus to people who didn't necessarily want to hear Jesus. The Jewish leaders came against him. The Roman leaders didn't understand what he was doing. Crowds came against him. But he kept following. I look at the life of the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 of the 26 books in the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I mean, amazing guy. And he kept pressing on. He was, he was empowered in ways that I think it's hard for us to comprehend because he kept standing strong no matter what he faced. So he's preaching Jesus all over the world, and yet he bore on his body 195 scars, at least. Because five times he was strapped up, his cloak was ripped off. They, they'd find out in that, in that time of history when they wanted to punish someone if they gave him 40 lashes, they'd generally kill him. So they'd give him 39 to take him within an inch of their life. This was done to Paul five times. The scars on his chest and sides and back were not scars like this. They were scars like this. 195 of them. And yet he kept preaching. He was relentless. He kept going out and ministering to the church. If you have any idea that becoming a Christian guarantees things always go your way, get to know this guy. <laughs> read the book of Acts. Read the letters that God inspired through him. But in, Job, uh, uh, but, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is giving a list of some of the things he suffered through following Jesus, through being, doing exactly what God called him to do. He followed Jesus. He preached the gospel. Here's some of the things that happened to him. In 2 Corinthians 11, 23, and he's not whining, he's declaring to people so they can understand what it means to follow Jesus, even when it's tough, and keep pushing on. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23, he said, I've worked much harder, I've been in prison more frequently, been thrown in jail for your faith lately? Paul was, many times. Been flogged more severely, I've been exposed to death again and again, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. They stoned him. They thought he was dead, and they threw him in the junk heap outside the city. He got back up, regained consciousness, and went to the next city and started preaching again. Where do you get the power to do that? Powerful people don't do that. They run out of power really quick. Maybe the first time someone straps you up and beats you 39 times. The powerless quit before they even get in trouble. <laughs> I don't want to risk offending anybody. He was empowered. 
He says, three times I was shipwrecked, and I spent a night and a day at the, on the open sea. If you read that whole passage, there's more stuff that he went through. How, how do you keep pushing on and keep pushing on when you know you're on the path that God has given to you, you know you're being faithful, and it's hard. I've met people who say, well, I thought I was doing what God wanted, but it got kind of difficult, so I guess I better stop. I must not be in God's will. Sometimes being on God's path is tough. Not always, but sometimes it is. And sometimes if you walk close to someone who's getting shot at, some of the bullets hit you. In our culture today, Jesus is being shot at. In ways in our culture that I think have never happened before. So are you going to separate from Jesus so you don't catch any collateral damage? Or are you going to walk in the power of Jesus even if there's shots coming at you? Paul's story inspires me. I've wondered before, when would I have quit preaching? The first time they strapped me up and left 39 scars on my body? Would that have been enough? The second time? The third time? The fourth time? The fifth time? He's writing after the fifth time. And he's still preaching Jesus. It's relentless. Because Paul didn't try to be Mr. Powerful. And Paul knew he wasn't powerless. He walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. He knew, book of Acts, you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses from where you are to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. So Paul remained powerful, not because he was powerful, but because the Spirit empowered him. Here's a lesson from Paul. Follow Jesus through the pain, the hurt, and the loss, even when you think about giving up. Even when you say, man, I don't know if I, don't know if I can take this anymore. I don't know if I can push. There, there, you, you know there were moments where Paul said, I don't know if I can take it. There's one point in the book of Philippians where Paul says, for, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What he's saying is this, I will keep living and serving because I will honor Jesus. But the day I die, I'll be better off. He's not looking to die, but he's saying, here's the reality. My life is so tough. But I'll, he says, but I'll stay here in the flesh, in this life, for the sake of serving Jesus and his church and the world. So he strapped him up again, and they beat him again, and he preached again. That's the kind of power that God can put within you. Some of you are hitting a moment where you go, I don't know if I can press through. I don't know if I can hang in there. I feel like I'm being faithful to God. I feel like I'm trying to do what he wants me to do, and I don't think I have the strength to press on. Guess what? You don't. You're going, and you're stuck here. And God says, let me come alongside. I'm not going to lift it all for you, but I'm going to do my part to help bring it with you, and you're going to say, look what God can do in and through someone like me. And he gets the glory, and you get empowered. Isn't that good news? In suffering and pain and sorrow, God shows up. So I want to listen again. I've asked someone else to, to read just a reflection. If Paul could be here, if Paul could speak to you today in terms of, of just hanging in there while you're following Jesus, what might he say? Let's listen together. Dear brothers and sisters, you feel beat down, discouraged, and disheartened? You have sought with a pure heart to follow Jesus, but things have not turned out like you anticipated. You wonder, does God care? Is he watching over me? Can I press on and keep standing for Jesus under the weight of my pain? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. God cares beyond your comprehension. He sees you and is with you. And... God is ready to empower you for the next step of your journey. The closer you walk with Jesus, the more you will learn that faithful servants do not stroll through life unscathed or march into heaven unscarred. We who walk closely with the crucified one will stumble forward, bearing the scars of being a disciple. We will hobble toward the empowered by the Holy Spirit for one more day, one more battle, one more faithful following. Then, if we have to, we will crawl across the finish line, 
with our lives poured out as a sacrifice for the Savior who bore the nails to scourge the mocking our sins. On that day, we will fall into his arms of the faithful Lord and feel his nail-pierced hands embrace you. You will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, and you will be home. Some of you need that word today. Some of you have been just trying to follow Jesus with all your strength. And you realize you're running out of strength. And you just got to make sure you plug in to the one who's already in you if you're a Christian. If you're not, and you're trying to kind of hang in there, man, there's a source of strength that he offers through faith in Jesus. We've met Job. There's a lot more you can do to get to know him. I encourage you to read his book. We've met Paul. Read the book of Acts. Read the 13 letters that bear his name. I want you to meet one more person. Her name is Hannah. Hannah's an amazing lesson. Lessons from Hannah. Faithful sacrifice honors God. Well, Hannah's story was a story of heartache. Again, I can't tell you the whole story, but if you go to 1 Samuel, you can read it. And if you're doing the, if you're doing the daily readings with the congregation, you'll read it as part of that. But Hannah just longed to have a child. That was her heart's desire. And for 20 years... Year after year, month after month, it wasn't going to happen. It didn't happen. And her heart was broken over and over again until one day she goes with her husband to Shiloh, the place of worship. They traveled quite a ways to get there, and they would go once a year, and she's there praying to God, crying out to God, asking God, please, 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 because it's always right to ask. It's always right to ask. She's 20 years into her asking. And this time... She has an encounter with Eli, the, the priest, and they talk, and he thinks she's been drinking because she's so caught up in her prayer that she's just, just crying out from the depth of her soul, and he, he thinks she's been drinking. She says, no, I'm crying out to God out of my anguish, and she's given a word from God that she's going to conceive. This is not prescriptive. It doesn't mean that if you pray long enough, hard enough, you're always going to get it. That's not the point. In her case, she got a word that said she would conceive, and she did, and the next year, she brought her son, little Samuel the joy of her heart, back to Shiloh. She traveled all the way to Shiloh, and she fulfilled what she had promised. Because when she prayed, and I don't recommend this either, but when she prayed, she said, God, if you give me a child, I will give him to your ministry all of his life. And in those days, what that meant was she brought her child to the place of worship, to Eli the priest, and she handed her son over to him and went back home again. A long trek back home. And once a year, she would come and visit her son and go home again. Can you imagine watching your child grow up in a once-a-year snapshot? What happens in a year's time? Click, 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 click. And every year, she would just think, well, how big will he be this year? She'd make him a little robe, and she'd bring it to her son. Here you go, Samuel. A few years later, here you go, Samuel. Years later, here you go, Samuel, <laughs> as he grows up. And, and, and Hannah experienced the empowering presence of God year after year after year after year as she sacrificed that which was most precious to her to the God who was most precious to her. And she gave her son. I want to read a short passage from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 25 to 28. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy, Eli, the boy to Eli, the priest, and she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. I have a question you can ask yourself. Am I a person who seeks to sacrifice even when it's painful? Empowered people can sacrifice. Empowered people have the strength of God even when it's hard, even when it costs, even when it, when it means laying their heart out on the altar. They, they can do it because they know that God strengthens them. They know that God will carry them through, that God will be there for them. So here's Hannah, this incredible story of faith. She does not feel powerful. I can do it all myself because she wasn't powerful and she knew it. But she didn't feel powerless. She never stopped praying. She never stopped crying out to God. 
But she walked in the presence of God, trusting in God year after year after faithful year. And one day, her dreams came true. But that dream she'd prayed for, she wouldn't hold in her arms every day and every night. She'd hand over to the one who would raise him, Eli. But her son Samuel became one of the most powerful prophets in the history of the Bible and the history of the world. He was a world-changing figure. And he walked in the power of God, just like his mama did. He learned to live a life of faith, even when it was hard. Because he had a mom who year by year by year kept offering him up to the Lord. I think sometimes in our Christian culture today, we've gotten used to kind of saying, I become a Christian, that's supposed to get me lots of favors and goodies and make my life easy all the time. Well, here's the reality. When you become a Christian, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, and God blesses you like crazy. That's true. But he also calls you to follow him. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you deny yourself every day, you take up the cross, and you follow me. Does carrying a cross, does being nailed to a cross sound easy? No. We've kind of reinvented Christianity into this sort of this easy thing that gets me what I want. And it's never been that, and it isn't now. What it is is a promise that when you put your faith in Jesus, when you come to the cross, the Holy Spirit moves in you, and you will have the power of God every moment of every day. So you don't have to be powerful, and you're not powerless, but every moment you are empowered. So like Job, you can hang in there through the suffering. So like Paul, you can follow Jesus even when it's hard, and you can keep following him. And so like Hannah, you can take everything and say, God, I can put it in your hands, and I can trust you because, God, you are trustworthy. And he empowers you and carries you through. I want to close with one line of scripture from the lips of Jesus. Uh, first, I'm sorry, let me, let, just let's quiet our hearts. I want to hear, I have someone that's going to read uh, just from the heart of Hannah. Let's quiet our hearts and listen to this. My friend, you are waiting, longing, praying, and dreaming. You wonder when everything will be made right and make sense. You still imagine that all your dreams might come true and your ending will be like ancient and modern fairy tales. God is bigger than our dreams. Were he not, our meager imaginations would limit the wonders that any of us could ever experience. God's plans encompass more than our personal wants and desires. He rules the universe and actually knows what he is doing. He really does. Trust God, even when you, it seems your prayers are not being answered. Even when you have choked out the same prayer for 20 years, keep trusting. Even when the script of your life does not make sense to you, even when you look over your shoulder and see your dreams fade on the horizon, Hold on. Trust God because he is worthy. One day, in this life or the next, you will look back and see what God bore something in and through you that accomplished his dream, his plan, and brought him glory. When God's dreams become yours, you will learn that the life of every faithful believer is exactly what God designed it to be. From the vantage point of heaven, your life will end with the words, happily ever after. Job, Paul, Hannah, and there's lots more. I want to finish with a word from the mouth of Jesus that kind of encapsulates the gospel, the message of Jesus. It's a scream that he cried out when he was hanging on the cross, bearing our sins and dying for us. We read this in Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemme sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We look at suffering and loss and pain and meet God in those moments. And we can do that because Jesus 
was forsaken by the Father to take all of our sins, to bear all of our shame. The perfect, sinless Lamb of God, the beloved Son of God, came to this world, hung on a cross, took all of our sins and our punishment and our shame and the very wrath of God. And at the moment that he took all of our sin on himself, and the moment that he made our brokenness something that could be healed, in the moment that he opened the doors for the power of God to flood into our lives, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, who had been in perfect harmony with the Father eternally, in some, in some mystical way we can't fully understand, experienced the God of heaven, his only Father, turn his back on Jesus while his wrath and judgment came upon him from the Father, and he took our sins, and he bore our shame. And now we can be empowered if we've come to that cross where Jesus bore our sins, if we've received Jesus and cried out for forgiveness and been cleansed by him. And we don't ever have to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We don't ever have to be alone. And you know what? You don't have to be Mr. or Miss Powerful. And you don't have to be powerless. You can walk every moment of every day in the glorious power of the God of the universe who entered human history, gave his life on a cross, rose again in glory, and will fill you by his spirit. Even in the times of suffering and pain and sorrow. Can I say this? Especially in the time of pain and suffering and sorrow. He is near and he's close and you can walk in his power. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we begin this journey together of discovering what it means to live an empowered life. And we pray for ourselves and each person around us and each person will be at our different services and our different venues, different places. Lord, will you help us to experience your power and your presence and your glory and your strength and your love that we might stand strong through the pain, that we might follow you even when it means sacrifice, that we might give up what's most precious so that we might worship the one who is most precious. Lord, help us on this journey together of walking and living an empowered life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want to hand our venues off to their venue pastors. and, and he,